This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today is Hans, who is wearing a Blood Diner shirt. We're celebrating horror. Hello. Uh, but we are watching Carl Reiner's Space Jam today, a classic hit of the 1990s. This was your selection. Is that? Did he direct that, really? I, uh, wow. Well, I, who's to say? I wouldn't be surprised. That's why I'm wondering who's to. He's that's, directing that's the a new question one. I've never, never. He's dead, isn't he? <laughs> no, he's not dead. He's alive. What do you mean? Carl Reiner's he's been, alive. Hasn't he been obese for like 50 years? How has he lasted so long? Is eating? You're, you're thinking of Rob baby? Reiner. And oh, Rob, right. Rob Reiner's yeah, unfortunately I, alive. Also, okay. How has he made it? Well, he's uh, How did he he's. Fight COVID? He's 70, and he's got the right connections. And, uh, you know, he's got that all-in-the-family money to keep him going. Right, yeah. It's like that uh, the governor from Jersey. What's his name? The the one that Chris has Christie. a fat pussy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the one with the fat vagina, yeah. That survived COVID, and then we're supposed to be scared of it after he survived it. Right. Now, today yeah. we are talking about uh, the original Exorcist film, William Friedkin's 1973 classic. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. The world of darkness. expected it nobody believed it and nothing could stop it there are no experts you probably know as much about possession as most priests look your daughter doesn't say she's a demon she says she's the devil himself i'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that! The one hope. The only hope. The exorcist. And uh, we were just talking about how you did not go with the typical stairs shot or the exorcist shot from the outside. You went with, what's his name? Lee J. Cobb staring at, yeah. what was it, Damien Karras' body? Yep. After he jumped out. After his, his uh, very short transformation. Yes. I ended up watching the, I ended up watching the, what is it? The, the version director's you've never cut, seen. No, called? hold on a second. It, this is not a director's cut. This is mislabeled as a director's right. cut all the time. Now, technically, if you, all right, it, it, it's kind of disingenuous. He did make the cuts voluntarily, not at his own uh, volition. He, he did that to appease his once enemy, now friend, the author of the book, William Peter Blatty. Um, who wanted certain elements of the film reinstated to heighten the supernatural aspects of it. Because if you do watch that 1973 version, I think, it's, I think there's an opportunity for the interpretation that many have had over the years that I did not understand. Because I, up until maybe about last year, I had only seen the 2000 re-release, the version you've never seen before. And that makes it crystal clear that it's entirely supernatural. In the right. 1973 original version, there is an interpretation you can come away with that this is entirely the perception of Damien Karras, in my opinion, anyway. That, 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 that's how I understood a lot of that. Because he is, he, he is the central character of the film. I don't think it's really Reagan, even though you're introduced right. to... I think you see Reagan... Out of the two of them, you see Reagan first. You're first introduced to yeah. Father Father um, Marin when he's in Iraq and he comes face to face with the statue. What did what, you think of that as an opening, by the way? Uh, it reminded me of Uncut Gems. Uh, I, <laughs> I uh, 
By the way, this movie is forever ruined by the scary movie too. Oh, that James intro Woods. With James Woods. I can't. I can't not see James Woods in that role. So when uh, when the priest came through the door the first time, the first thing that popped in my head was that scene of James Woods just being like, "Oh fuck this," and walking away. Uh, and that very short joke that they do, and I think it's a scary movie too. You, at the beginning. Uh, you might be the only person to find scary movie two more enduring <laughs> than the original Exorcist. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's probably because uh, I, I had only seen it maybe once or twice when I was very young, so it's not it's not one that I uh, I don't know. I, I know that it's a classic and everything, and I know that. It's influenced a lot of movies, but it's another one of those that I, I guess I just didn't see when I was old enough. So I didn't understand the uh, how, how iconic it is, because when I was exposed to it, uh, I had already been exposed to movies that were inspired by it. So it's never been that, you know, um, it, it's never meant that much to me, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Sure, which yeah. is I think understandable because I think if it, if it hits you at the at a certain point in time, then uh, it can be the defining horror film. But if you wait too long and then you watch it, a lot of people come away with the interpretation that it's a silly film, that it's uh, yeah. not scary at all. Uh, it, it, it seems to be polar opposite takes of this movie. Um, so you started with the 1973 version, the original theatrical cut. And then you watched the 2000 remastered uh, scenes were implemented and also just little photos overlaid into shots. Uh, Very See, this this is a problem with directors when they have the, the chance to go back to their earlier works and they're like, hmm, this is, I mean, this is what I probably would have done at age 25 when I directed this. The whole Wong Kar Wai thing where he's getting his movies re-released by Criterion in uh, a new remastered print. And he goes, wait a minute, hold on. I can I can touch up these files here. Uh, I can I can play with the colors a little bit. Okay, well these are I mean, this is all natural green, but what if it was red? What if I turned it blue? What if I made this whole movie uh, purple? What if I do that? <laughs> Friedkin loves to do that. William Friedkin, when they re-released the French Connection, that was originally uh one color tone. When the Blu-ray comes out, he has his little editor, he's like, here. Do this. I want it to look like a 1950s romance film or whatever he had in his mind. And all of a sudden, it's you know highly saturated. It's more colorful or it's more washed out. It, it, it's a total mess. They should not be... Well, I mean, who am I to say who can do what with their own creative works? But, uh, you know, this is not something that should be enabled or uh, celebrated. Unless it was taken away from you and turned into something that's completely different than what your vision was, I don't think it's justified for them to just go back and change things now that they have a different vision of it or, you know, a different idea or different technology even. Like, um, what's his name did with Star Wars? Uh, Lucas. Or, yeah, or or the E.T. walkie-talkie thing uh, where it's like, well, we do have the technology now, so let's just... Let's change it uh, and uh, change some of the purpose of whatever the thing is that we're changing or the meaning of it by just making this change that has no, no merit or no reason to, to exist really other than just them messing with it. Right. I, I think I said this maybe on AI where I was talking about how I had watched THX for the first time and I was like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't look like early 1970. That looks like yeah. 2003 or something. And it turned out that George Lucas, of course, had tampered with it. So that, that's an issue. That's the biggest issue, I think, with the version you've never seen before. Otherwise, the scenes that are implemented, I think, enhance the movie. The spider walk sequence has become something that is iconic. They released like an action figure of that. It's one of the more memorable yeah. things to come out of that film, one of the more memorable pieces of iconography. And... Um, I think there might be some scenes with Marin that are put back into the there's movie. There's a there's a scene where which I I think is the only one that actually worked for me. Uh, I think the spider one it, it's it's iconic and everything, but uh, it kind of failed out of place where they put it. Uh, it kind of felt like uh, a shock that obviously you're not expecting, but then uh, 
is the first time that she's ever out of the room and that's never mentioned again and it's just a thing that happens so it feels really out of place with everything else that happens inside of that room uh but i think that the one scene that works for me is when um when they're both exhausted outside of the room and they have like a little bit of dialogue there as to like they don't know what to do or how to uh fight uh the the what is it pazuzu or Paz- no no whatever. we don't call he's the devil <laughs> in this one he's the right. devil True. Next week right. when we're talking about it, then we're talking about right. Pazuzu. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently on the original one, they just looked at each other and then that's it. There's no dialogue there. There's nothing that happens. Now that and also at the end in the scene where the devil gets inside of uh, Father Karras, uh, his face changes a little bit, like becomes a little demonic, like Regan for a couple of seconds. And that was well done. Uh, was that not in the original? It, it, I could have. I mean, maybe no. it was just the contact lenses that were in the '73 cut, but I, 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 I feel like. A, I think they added. They added like a little bit of more, more than just the eyes, though. Like his face changes a little bit, and, and they tried doing that earlier with Reagan, Reagan and it doesn't work. Like it, I think they tried to do an overlay with uh, that spooky face that shows in the dark with the goofy. That's that's teeth. terrible. That's so uh, bad. I mean, look. Yeah. I I yeah. like I like the subliminal cuts to that white face of the demon i think that looks very good it's very effective when it's two or three frames when you just have it like on the kitchen counter pop up just fade in and it stays there and it's just hanging out there (laughs) that's terrible that's so bad but um again you know that's just old man syndrome you know he feels very mighty boosh you know very much like a bit from from a show like that a very random humor type of thing right I mean, he's, I think Friedkin was probably in his fifties at this point. Um, you know, he's a man of about 80 years old nowadays. So yeah, yeah, it, it, it sounds about right. I don't think there's ever been, actually, no, that's not true. There, there's one instance that comes to mind where a re-edit has improved the movie. We might be talking about this in the not so distant future. Uh, the killing of a Chinese bookie, the re-edit of that movie, the 1978 re-edit of that movie is far superior, in my opinion, to the original 1976 version, which I think is about 40 minutes longer and is mostly just like uh, uh, cabaret club scenes that that were included uh, that wind up getting axed, and it just makes it a more concise film. It's a much better film. Otherwise, you know, if they there's a 30 year gap in the edit, you're you're screwing yourself. You're going to kill whatever you're you know hoping to to accomplish with this remaster. Um, so something, something positive to say about the 1973 uh, cut is, I have a thing. go ahead. The body horror, the, no, I'm, I'm not talking about what most people know about, which is the, whenever she becomes the, the demon uh, and all that gross uh, pea soup thing. I'm talking about the hospital scenes. That shit was horrifying to me. Every every little test and everything they did, the the little needle thing with the yeah. with the little blood that was just shooting out of her neck, all of that was so well done. And it showed how terrifying uh, medicine was in the 70s, where everything, yeah, yeah. there's just gigantic loud machines next to her face to get like the x-rays of her brain or whatever that was. Uh, and it just looks like a traumatic experience. It looks more scary than what happens later in the movie. Or at least, I guess I've been I've been uh, in the hospital before, where you, you go into like a machine that you don't know what it's going to do. So that's way scarier than you know a demon because I'm not someone that believes in that type of shit. So for me, those moments of her being a little girl in, in the middle of all of that was much scarier than what happened later. I completely agree with you. That was very unnerving for me. When I watched this movie at age nine um, and my horror movie experience was like Freddy Krueger and not even early Freddy Krueger, but like Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare with Tom Arnold and Roseanne Barr, goofy, funny right. Freddy. Oof. And right. then I, like Chuck- I, yeah, or Chucky. Yes. Yeah. I was big into the slasher films. Uh, so I, you know, they're all kind of goofy after a certain point. It's really only the first movie or, or two where they're actually trying to be scary. Uh, right. I, I get into the exorcist at age nine and those hospital sequences were, were really, Ooh, that was a tough watch as a, as a young lad. 
And, uh, you know, I was terrified by everything else, of course. This is a, for a long time, I consider this uh, definitely the scariest movie uh, that I had watched. But the hospital sequences especially are extremely effective. Uh, it, the old technology just, of it, you know. It feels very real. It feels very, this is normal. This is just a camera that's here. This is actually happening. Uh, the way that everything is shot and the way that everything looks is just very realistic and, and unnerving. Uh, especially because you know that non, like nothing is going to resolve whatever her issue is here. So everything that they're doing is just, you know, pointless at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think the uh, there's a similar effect with like the mental ward sequences, which I, I feel accurately portrays what uh, you know psych, psych, psychi- uh, psych, psychiatric wards were in the 1970s which is a bunch of old, mentally ill, <laughs> wandering uh, wandering around some facility with maybe one or two nurses, and they'll come up to you. And, you know, all those people got dumped out into the streets in the 1980s yeah. with Reagan. So, um, yeah, creepy stuff. You know, that's explored more in Exorcist 3, which maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe we won't. We'll we'll see how we're feeling after these, these next uh, couple of episodes. But, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of... I think the strength of this movie is that it is so grounded in reality with all the external elements and it doesn't consider itself a horror film. Right. Right. And uh, I, I, because I, I know that Friedkin is not very religious, so... Oh, he is now. Uh, he is now. Is Did he... you see The Devil and Father of Morth? No. Don't no. see it. Don't see it. Uh, it okay. he just he it, it's his most recently directed film. I think it came out in 2017 or 2018. It's a documentary about him watching a re, a real possession, and he a- alters the voice and adds sound effects. And it's 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 really again it's more of his old man brain acting up, but now he's even older, okay. so it doesn't it's not good. Don't check it out. Okay, <laughs> because uh, the the movie feels like it's shot by someone that's just trying to show you. <laughs> what what's happening as realistic as possible it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's someone that actually believes in the thing because it doesn't glorify the priests it doesn't glorify any aspect that that comes with the good side you know it's 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 very much like a matter of fact like this is happening and and the way that he shoots it uh, uh something that i noticed was that uh, when uh when he's cutting in dialogue or when he's cutting in the action he never goes back or i don't know if he did i when I noticed it, I, I I started paying attention to it, and I didn't know if he did before. But uh, he when he cuts, uh, he never cuts back to the same frame. He he always cuts back to something different. So that makes everything a little bit more intense uh, because uh, it, it, there's a lot of movement with the camera and a lot of uh, um, just the, the intensity that it gives you uh, not having just static shots that go back and forth uh, so that you don't really focus on the dialogue. You focus more on what's going to happen next. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, feel, I, think... I, I feel like if it, if, if it was more of a believer, uh, he would have at least tried to glorify the good side a little bit more than, than what he ends up doing. At this. I completely agree. I think this is what Darren Aronofsky has been trying to capture with his recent career with Mother, with Noah, of I'm not religious. I don't believe in anything in this text that I'm going to be adapting, but uh, I'm going to offer my spin of it because maybe that'll be interesting. And instead, it just comes across as like the amazing atheist directed Mother. You know, it's awesome. Hey, hey guys, how do you feel about bionicle but in noah <laughs> you know the little, the little rock robots mm. <laughs> or robots the little monsters that just made a rock yeah yeah what, so, uh, that's another, another one that started very promising and then what happened you know what happened is he decided really, to adapt noah's arc as darren aronofsky he made a big <laughs> mistake um yeah no at this time friedkin was not religious i i think he was like a non-practicing jew and uh, William Peter Blatty was obviously Catholic and had attempt. I, I mean, I think he, he was going to make a stab at becoming a priest earlier in his youth and ultimately decided not to. And, um, you know, they, that was, I think, one of the main issues with, um, you know, Blatty's interpretation of Friedkin's film. You know, it was the kind of like the Stephen King, Stanley Kubrick thing where it's like, 
well, you removed X, Y, and Z supernatural elements. You changed the whole meaning of what this could be. Although I think that even in the 73 one, I don't lend that to the the uh, idea that it's all in Father Karras's head. I think you can see it that way. You cannot see it with the 2000 version. But I think it's plain as day, like an actual exorcism and demonic possession that's occurring in the movie. I don't think they ever at, at any point try and deter you from that idea or that notion. Now, what do you think about that theory that it's all supposed to be like sex abuse or sexual abuse or something? The that Rob Ager theory? Which is, yeah. that's everything. That's everything he has ever theorized about a film that's like mystical at all. Is It all comes back to sex <laughs> abuse. I actually think, I actually do think there's something probably to that. Um, but less so here, more so in The Shining. In The Shining original screenplay, I've been told okay. reports of um, the abuse that Jack Torrance dished out to Danny was not from the book where he breaks his arm when he's drunk but rather there's some implication of sex abuse. And uh, the things like the the Playgirl magazine that he's reading in the lobby of The Overlook are intentional uh, to Stanley Kubrick and not just like Jack fucking around showing up to the set with a Playgirl magazine for kicks one day. Right, you know? right, um, right. Yeah. I think that's probably more so the case with that film, less so the case with this one, but I, it, I it's a valid, it's a valid take. It lines it's, up. I think it... it 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 would make sense if the movie was maybe 20 minutes shorter if the ending let's say that you're short 20 minutes from that because if it was really rooted on that idea that that's the reason why this is all happening or i, I don't know if the the theory is that you know this is the reason why this is happening is because of what happened to the girl but uh, there's not much of an interaction between Reagan and anyone else but the priests for what feels like what 40 minutes uh, at the end of the movie, uh, from the moment when uh, Karis meets her or goes to meet her, that uh, ha- they have like that little uh, interaction with the fake um, holy water. Uh, to the end, um, there's not much of a mention of anyone else other than you know the mom that's you know sucking what is it dicks or sucking cocks in hell and yeah and uh, everything else is related to Karis and the other priests so. If well, that was hold, hold on. true, then I... that's not entirely correct because we have Burt Dennings, the director of the film that the mother is working on, who goes upstairs to spend time with Reagan and then winds up killed. Uh, he winds up uh, with his head oh, twisted around, having fallen out the window. So that you could easily make that tie that there's something going on with the director or what have you. But uh, even still, you know, things are acting up beforehand. She's away from the dad. Yeah. You know, there's a... I think I think you could draw a through line of things that would line up with that theory for the film. But again, there's too much of it in place that is irrelevant to... Uh, that, would, that would be rendered irrelevant if that was the correct uh, view of the film. Well, they, they keep all of that vague, right? So that we don't really know exactly when she gets possessed. Or when it all started, it's just one day she starts cursing, and well, no, no, uh, she doesn't no, want her. Not not exactly. It's after she goes to the attic, and uh, plays with the Ouija board, plays, Ouija board, and starts talking about Captain Howdy. Captain Howdy is not somebody who exists prior to um, a lot of that happening, I believe. Or or okay. he's like an imaginary friend or something that eventually winds up personifying in this demon that inhabits her body. Because to me, it feels like from the beginning, the demon was targeting Father Ka- Is it Karis or Callus? Karis, it's Karis. Right R. No, yeah. you're confusing uh, other last names. I, w- I wouldn't know who. I just, I just know he's Greek, so I I, you know, I know those those names are goofy sometimes. Uh, the, what was I saying? Fuck, I lost my train of thought about him. Something some about molestation. Oh, right, right, right. He, uh, no, <laughs> he, uh, I, I, it feels like he's being targeted by this demon from the beginning because uh, everything that has to do with his mom and everything that he brings up trying to get to him, um, it, it feels like it was more of, a, of an attack on him. And also, yes. I guess that's why it feels like it's his movie. Uh, he's our main character that right. we follow with his mom. So 
that that that, that mm, that's one thing that I was a little bit iffy about. That you know, it's it it, it feels like it's too much of by chance that she got this one demon and you know everything worked out so that the father carrots who was who the demon was targeting from the beginning is the one that ends up there you know right so that 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 i think renders the reagan was touched and she's acting out due to mental illness due to borderline personality disorder or whatever it might be uh, not a valid theory with the exorcist. I think it comes down to you either, you can either take it at face value that it is a story about demonic possession. And I think that is correct. Or you can do the, this is all Damien Karras's this, in his head. This is all in his head. This is a mentally ill girl. He's filling in the gaps every time he's off screen and not with her. Um, and this is just what he learns. This is his take based off of what he's hearing from the mother, what he's hearing from the Catholic Church, and everybody who has sent him to go perform this exorcism. But the problem with that is we're introduced to Marin first and foremost during his trip to Iraq. And he meets the... He comes face-to-face with the statue of Pazuzu. And if you remove that element, I think you can you can put it more in the Karis spin, that it's all Karis's, uh perspective of things. But without that, and without the the elements of a greater evil and some kind of old battle that's been taking place, and this is just the next round of it, then it, it's a demonic possession. Right. And at the time, wh- why do you think this is the one that hit like it did? Because there's a lot of possession movies that were coming out at that time. Or... I don't know if a lot, but I know that there's a couple that came out before this one. So this is not the first Possession movie that came out. Do you think it's more because of the graphic nature of it that has more of an impactful... I think uh, I, it definitely plays a part. It, it's one of the earliest films to have this level of what I'll call gore, even though it's not really gore. It's not traditional gore like what you or I, or probably what's in Blood Diner, you know, uh, would, would think of when that word is used. But things like the hospital scenes you had mentioned weren't really in films during that time. And, uh, you know, having a a small child shout vulgarities and her face be a mess and talking about sexual things and the masturbation with the cross. Uh, In the 1970s, when America was still a religious country, that's that's I mean, that's huge. Like in New York and L.A., they're probably thinking this is an interesting piece of art. You go to Colorado, you go to Minnesota, they're thinking, we're going to go to hell if we watch this movie. And that's like a legitimate thing. So it's understandable Colorado, why. Colorado, really? Sure, yeah. That's Colorado's, the one you pick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, now they're legalizing I weed and whatnot. Very, yeah, I thought that was a very progressive state, isn't it? It wasn't always. Okay. It wasn't always, okay? Know. Things change. Okay. Um, but But just to that point... It's a shocking film for a number of different reasons. So it was kind of, it rattled the culture for the time. And also, in addition to that, it's a very bold movie for a company in 1973, that's early 70s, for a company like Warner Brothers to make and put out there and have like a big budget behind. And, um, you know, the star power of having A-list director William Friedkin. I think The French Connection came before this. I could be wrong about that. Um, 71, I think. This was a this was this was a hot commodity, and I think the the novel was a bestseller. So there was a lot of hype around this movie. Originally, it was going to star Stacy Keach as Father Karras, and he was cast. He was yeah. paid for his role. I believe he still gets a a little check in the mail anytime The Exorcist is played on television. But he is uh, he's he's pushed out of the role because William Friedkin has a, uh, uh, a trip to New York that's scheduled, and he goes to see a play called The Championship Season, which is Jason Miller's play, who, I mean, he, I think he won, what did he win? He won, he won some, like, very prestigious literary prize for that. Uh, that's escaping my memory at the moment for his play. Tony Award. No, not the, no, not the Tony Awards. Um, <laughs> it'll come back to me. Oh, Peabody. The, no, I don't think uh, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, it, it's it's not really uh, 
It's not really relevant. Not Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jason Miller, I believe, is also an actor in his own play. Oh, it actually did win the Tony Award for the best play, so you're technically right. I was thinking the Pulitzer uh-huh. Prize. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh-huh. 1973, it wins the, the, the Tony for, for best play, the same year that The Exorcist comes out. Big year for Jason Miller. So um, Friedkin sees him in this play. He's, he's convinced he has to cast him as Father Karras. Uh, much to the dismay of Warner Brothers, who, again, has already paid Stacy Keach. Stacy Keach uh, knows the script practically off book at this point, and they are ready to get rolling on this movie. He is let go and wisely, in my opinion, replaced with yeah. Jason Miller. Yeah. I, I saw that I, uh, also uh, Jack Nicholson was also considered for that role, and uh, I, I can't see n- neither of them playing it because they're they're too much of when, when you cast stacy keach for a role you're getting stacy keach so you're you know what you're gonna get from him you know that character that voice uh you know uh that personality that's kind of cocky kind of a dick without being a dick i i, I think this character needed someone that was vulnerable looking someone that could show like a, a little bit more of a troubled uh, character in their face more than what Nicholson could do because Nich- Nicholson would just look insane. Uh, so you wouldn't believe that this priest is even suffering any type of conflict internally because of, you know, it would just look like a, like a Jack Torrance, right? So maybe I, I don't have know. You ever seen, Nicholson... um, have you ever seen the King of Marvin gardens? No, Jack Nicholson and Bruce Stern star in the, and Ellen Burstyn actually. Uh, starring that movie. It's a Bob Rafelson film from the BBS era. And Nicholson and Bruce Stern kind of do a swap where Nicholson is like a much more reserved, toned down character. And Bruce Stern is the over the top flamboyant guy. And Nichol- I mean, I think it's one of Jack Nicholson's best performances. But to what you're saying, I don't think he can convey inner turmoil well. He goes right. to a level. So he- you would have this reserved Nicholson, which. Would be I could I can imagine that movie. I think it's a very different movie and not a good not as good of a movie. Um, I think it's probably yeah. it pr- probably becomes a a more forgettable commercial Warner Brothers film from the nineteen seventies. Still probably good, but not having the impact that this movie had. I think if you have him in that role, he goes from zero to ten, and that's not that wouldn't really work for the Father Karras character. Same with Stacy Keach. I can't. I can't see the the Titus's dad as that. You know. You only. Father. You, you only was... know him as Titus's dad. <laughs> That's the first one that popped in my head, and I know that Titus is a fucking cock now. But that show is still. I, I mean, I don't know if he still holds up. But that was my first introduction to Stacy Keach. Uh, Most people and, don't uh, remember that show, Titus. It ran for like <laughs> one season or two seasons on Fox. Three, I have the DVDs, oh. uh, but <laughs> but I uh, uh, there's some a movie with Stacey Keach. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but he's like a truck driver. It's like this kind of actiony movie from I think it's either 80s or 70s, and he plays this truck driver, and he has more of a more of a hero uh, role, and it works in that movie. But he do, I I don't think he has that, or I guess I've never seen him playing a role where. You know, it's this vulnerable character that is supposed to fight through his inner demons and show it on his face without showing any type of physicality, I guess. Uh, Stacey Keach is scary by just the way he speaks, uh, you know. So I, I, I don't know if that I- interaction between him and, and Reagan, where he's supposed to be terrified, he will be able to convey it properly. Or I can't imagine him doing that. Maybe I just have to go back to his career in the seventies, maybe he has something there where he's playing something like that. But I mean, it would would certainly be more believable when he's punching her in the face repeatedly at the end. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Smashing Uh, her head into the tiles. No, uh, actually Stacy Keach in the 1970s is not Stacy Keach in the eighties or nineties that, or like body bag Stacy Keach. Uh, there's a, there's actually, there's a technical, you know, there's a there's a linear sequel to this Exorcist film that is not Exorcist to the Heretic, which we'll be talking about next week, um, called called uh, <laughs> yes, 
Made, I just realized that I've watched almost every Exorcist movie because of this. Have you seen show Exorcist three? No, that's the that's I think that's the one that I'm missing because I've seen Dominion, I've seen the be- beginning, I think it's called. Yep. Exorcist the beginning, the and alternate then cut, two, yeah. and now this one. And my own, I'm, I think I'm only missing three, right? I believe so. Yeah, and then there's the series that Ty West has been directing for seven years or whatever. I don't know. And then the David Gordon Green version that's going to be coming out. That was canceled. That was good for a couple. I, I watched a couple of episodes. I think it only lasted one season, and they canceled it. Two. Um, Two. Oh. The Ninth Configuration. That's the movie. The Ninth Configuration uh, is directed by William Peter Blatty, and it features Jason Miller and Stacey Keach and uh, another actor who's who the guy who played Herschel on Walking Dead. You know who I'm Scott talking about? Wilson. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a. You know, there's a connection to The Exorcist with that movie. And I think if you want a proper adaptation of William Peter Blatty's work, um, you go Exorcist, you go uh, Ninth Configuration, and then you go Exorcist Three, which was originally called Dominion. Was it? No, Legion. No. Excuse me. Dominion was the prequel. Legion, yeah, I just, yeah. I just had, had Dominion is the... the- the minute is the one with the red guy, the the red yes. demon thing with the yeah. giant head. Right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, no, Exor- Exorcist 3 is actually a very good movie. That is a movie that has come around to a lot of people, kind of like Halloween 3, where... I thought F- Exorcist 2, I thought Exorcist 2 was that, and then I watched it, and I was like... No, 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 no. I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess it's one of those Dr. Sleep times when I'm the only person that doesn't <laughs> like it, and everyone knows <laughs> Is amazing because because I was watching that yesterday and I was just like, what the what is this supposed to be like? I just don't get it, I guess, because these fucking sucks. No, 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 no. You are definitely in the majority on that one. I I am in the minority here because I like Exorcist to the Heretic. I I think I think it's a well, look. We, we'll have a lot to talk about next week because we'll also have a guest for that show. Um, so I don't want to say too much, but I think there's a lot of interesting things that are going on with that movie, and it comes out. A bit of a me- a little bit more than a mess, maybe. Um, and it's I didn't, I didn't hate it, and there's a lot of very cool things that are done in it. But at the end of the movie, I, I, I'll, I'll save it. Let's say, was, yeah, we'll save so it. We'll yeah. save it. We'll save it for that. There's still a lot to unpack so here. The good with... ones, so, the, so the good, the good ones three then. Yeah, that's the so one that people the, like. What's the timeline then? Is well, three are, okay. following two or? No, it ignores two. If if you want, if you really want like a good chronological version of it, right? The truest form of an Exorcist trilogy is the Exorcist, the Ninth Configuration, and then Exorcist Three. Okay. Exorcist right. Two is a commercial, commercial sequel. Uh, Dominion and the beginning, those are commercial sequels. They have nothing to do with William Peter Blatty or his work. There's nothing that is sourced in the literature there except for the name Pazuzu, which was existing even before his novel. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, I mean, it, it, it's like, uh, it's, it's like the Halloween series. You got all these different pathways that you can go down. Even the series offers a, a different pathway because that's still Reagan McNeil, right? Gina Davis plays a grown up Reagan. Right. So uh, yeah. back on this film, who do you think uh, gives the best performance? I think this is loaded with phenomenal performances from everybody. Max von Sydow is, is great. And, uh, you know, people like to credit the old age makeup and whatnot, but he really does sell being an old man in this movie, even though he's only in his 40s. That's something that's very difficult to do, is not only look like an old man, but properly act like an old man, have that register as legitimate when you're acting, yeah. you know. His physicality is very old man-ish. Right. Not just his face, like the way his body moves and the way that he moves when he's fighting. Reagan feels very old man-ish. I think uh, the mom was the best performance. Uh, I think her character is really important to keep the story grounded in reality uh, because she's not a believer at the beginning of it. And so she tries to find any other type of solution before you know landing into exorcism which is why we see all those tests and all those visits to psychologists and all that uh that uh kind of grounded it a little bit more than if it was just 
a movie about a demon. Uh, so her character was really important for me to to get into the story, and I also thought that she was great at it. She was great at, at portraying that pain of a mother that would feel if her if this would happen to her daughter, and also. Uh, all of her very vulnerable moments that happen later in the movie too are very believable. Uh, so her, uh, it's uh, what's her name, Ellen Burstyn. Ellen Burstyn, is who is probably yeah. going to be nominated for an Oscar this year for a film that she did. So I couldn't tell you the name of the film. I couldn't tell you the name of any film from this past year, really. Your favorite though is the front runner, Nomad Land. I know you're very excited about that. You want to see Francis McDormand win yet again. <clears throat> that's the front runner <laughs> i think so Ugh, god damn okay yeah yeah it's uh it's it'll have you be seen great it? no i haven't i probably won't watch it either i'm i'm out on 2020 i don't want to go back I, I i took the recommendation of a brett easton ellis that lovers rock the steve mcqueen movie series episode from small acts was good and it wasn't bad but he was like this is probably the best movie i've watched this year and it was like 70 minutes of people just dancing at a party. I was like, all right. I, I, I mean, it, I get they're, they're capturing a vibe here with this, but it's not like, I, I don't know. Come on. It's not the best movie of the year. Anyway. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. You should, I think you should see it just because you watch Sweetie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweetie, cool. Sweetie. Yeah, Sweetie <laughs> yeah. was a New Zealand or Australian film from 1989 with a fat woman who plays a mentally ill lady in a family. And there's a lot of implied sex abuse with that. I'll say that. Sweetie, Jane Campion, who is the second woman ever nominated for Best Picture. I mean, excuse me, Best Director Oscar. How about that? For what? For Sweetie? For No, no, not for Sweetie. For uh, She did some movie, I think, with Nicole Kidman. I, the the name of the movie is the hours? in my memory. Yes, The Hours. Uh, what's the movie where she has sex with Anthony Hopkins? Oh jeez! Can uh, he? <laughs> I, no, this, there's some movie. It's really gross. Uh, <laughs> wait, what? Nicole isn't Can He Linda out. Blair's porn film? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. It just popped in my head. Maybe <laughs> is it? I know that her career after the X. I mean, obviously, you just have to go to the Heretic. Was not very good. Was not very promising. But she wound up doing like a late seven. So in the 1970s, the the genre of like a smutty movie like a real movie like a soft core movie and and like a real movie and then a hardcore movie where if that those lines were very blurred so she wound up doing a late 70s movie called something like canned heat where she's a female prisoner yeah, and she's having sex with yeah. guards or whatever they were shot with the same camera so they all look the same right the everything is 16 and, millimeter uh, <laughs> the cheapest stock yeah. chained yeah. heat chained heat that's chained late 80 heat. uh early 80s 1983 um, Paul Nichols, Paul. Okay, all right. Anyway, uh, what do you think about William Friedkin as a director in general? I'm not very familiar with his work, to be honest. Uh, I've seen Italian Job, but no, he didn't do that, Italian uh, Job. He did the Brinks Job with Peter Falk and Peter Boyle. Italian Job was somebody else. Wait. No, French Connection. Why am I thinking Italian job? I'm thinking Little Car. Good. Mark Wahlberg <laughs> I'm on the Little mind. Car, sorry, Italian job. Seth Green, no, Little Man. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. I, I, I don't really know how many of his movies I've seen. Uh, I've seen Rules of Engagement I've seen. That was kind of... Well, he didn't do that either. He That was that was uh, Brett Easton Ellis' partner. It says oh, wait, that's Rules of Attraction. Excuse me. I don't. I'm really off tonight. Yeah, stop I'm bad. <laughs> Getting stop all these titles me. fucked up. Yeah, I have it right here. I have it on my phone. Who's in uh, Rules of Engagement? Is that Benicio del Toro, or is that Hunted? No, that's uh, Samuel L. Jackson and and Tommy Lee Jones. Oh right, it's an army movie. You're right. Yes, I didn't know he directed that. I have seen that. Let's see. Tales from the Crypt. So that's a couple of episodes there. The Guardian, Rampage, Cat Squad. To live and die in L.A. I've never seen that. But that sounds familiar. We uh, should we should definitely do an episode on to live and die in L.A. That is uh, that's in the same texture as something like Manhunter. It has uh, William Peterson from Manhunter playing a cop again, and Willem Dafoe is the bad guy. He's a counterfeiter, 
I think Daryl Hannah's in the movie as well, playing his girlfriend. And uh, she's got a similar look to a Blade Runner, uh, you know, aesthetic. It's a very well done movie with a, it's probably best known for its ending. I'll say that. It's William, William Peterson good in it? Or is he William Peterson? He's good. He's, be- <laughs> I, he's I think he's actually probably better in To Live and Die in L.A. than he is in Manhunter. Okay. I've seen Cruising, of course. Do you know the story uh, about Cruising and The Exorcist? No. So no. in the hospital scene, the killer from Cruising uh, was one of the actors in that scene. The Sorry, the source material of Cruising is there's a serial killer who's out killing gay men uh, after picking them up from clubs. The man who admitted yeah. to the murders is one of the the nurses in the scene in The Exorcist, which is why William uh, Friedkin was attracted to the material. And he went and visited the guy afterward, and he was like, yeah, I don't remember killing all those guys. I remember killing one of the guys, but the police said I, they'd give me a lighter sentence if I just said I killed all of them. So I said I killed all of them. And he's out. He's out. He's wandering the streets right now, probably around me. So good for him. Nice. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of gay guys. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not very familiar with his work. I, I know his name a lot because you mentioned it a lot. Uh, but it's one of it's the same as uh, the other episodes that we've done. You know, it's a uh, name uh, when we do a, an, an episode that specific to one director most of the time it's just a name that you really recognize but it's i'm not very familiar with their work sure. he's definitely one of those so I, I think i've only seen what three of his movies uh i think so i don't really have much much of an educated opinion but i did like sorry <laughs> i did like uh the way this is shot uh the way everything moves uh very like there, there's not a lot of dull moments. Everything is constantly moving, uh, and the story is constantly moving, and and the the performances were all great. So, um, just using this and cruising as a as an example, then he's great. But I I'm, I can't say that because I'm not educated really. I would say <laughs> I, here, my opinion on William Friedkin is that he's probably the best living American director currently. Um, maybe not like currently active, but like of people who are alive today. I think he's better than Scorsese. I think he's better than uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Abel Ferreira. What do you think he offers that they don't in his movies? Or that, what makes his movies better? That I, uh, hmm. That's difficult to, to assess on the fly. I'd have to really think about that, but I, I, I think he's just got a, a much stronger track record Um and he's got a smaller amount of films within his his catalog of um, directed movies, but he's got a, a great string of, of films that I think starts with, uh, I mean, really his first movie, The Boys in the Band, from I think that was 1970. Even Certainly. that, you know, where it's just like a bunch of gay men getting together for a party. Uh, he does so many interesting things with the direction and style of that film, where... On the surface, that 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 uh, synopsis, that uh, slug line of yeah, it's just a bunch of gay men hanging out in the '70s, does not sound interesting to me at all. It was one of the last films of his I checked out, but even that is a, a, a pretty <laughs> I good mean, movie. The, the slug line is slightly different, but <laughs> what, do, what, do, what does it say? What does it say? It says tempers fray and true selves are revealed when a heterosexual is accidentally invited to a homosexual party. Yes, so it's exactly what I said. A bunch of gays having a tea <laughs> so party together, party. playing dress up, wearing their wearing mommy's <laughs> clothes, strutting around in the mirror. Who's the prettiest wearing lady? Yeah. <laughs> what sorcerer? This sorcerer oh, is sorcerer awesome. is amazing. Sorcerer is a remake. Look at right on YouTube right now. Can't even show you. God damn it. Someone just wrote the ninth configuration rules. Matt O'Brien commented. Good timing, Matt O'Brien. Um, Sorcerer is amazing. Right. Sorcerer was released the same year as Star Wars, same weekend as Star Wars, and was squashed. It's a remake of The Wages of Fear, starring Roy Scheider, and it is one of the more impressive accomplishments in film, probably, I would say, especially for the 1970s. All right. Well, to go back to the <clears throat> the question I made about Freaking being 
better? Do you think it's the subject matter that he chooses for his movies? Do you think it's a type of movie that he makes or, or, or the performances he gets from actors? Or what makes you like his movies better than all of the other directors that you mentioned? I, again, I, I have a difficult time um, giving like a good reason that would, I'd, I'd really have to think about that. I, I'd really have to sit and think and write that out. Uh, I just know for the 1970s that his commercial output, probably beginning with French Connection and ending with Cruising uh, in the 80s, there's something about the style that he employs in each one of these films. Actually, you know, To Live and Die in L.A., even though that feels a little too Michael Manny at times, it doesn't quite have his 1970s uh, flair uh, that that he, you know, uh, em started employing with, I think, French Connection. Um, there's just something that's more consistent to that, and there's a greater level of artistry in things that you wouldn't even think about necessarily, like the ADR. A lot of the, I mean, Exorcist 73 is entirely ADR, I'm fairly certain. And mm -hmm. just the, the level of having the actors nail that and you not even really think about it as you're watching yeah. the movie. Maybe at times, you know, there's a, you know, one or two blips, but on I didn't the whole, notice, to be honest. yeah, the <clears throat> being able to nail the performances in the recording booth and also um, a lot of the stunts, a lot of the. I mean, his techniques in the 1970s are kind of infamous because he would subject actors to essentially real abuse. He would, uh, there's a famous story about Ellen Burstyn where she wasn't given a level of performance that he wanted for a shot, where I think it's the scene where the, the dresser is going across the room to lock her in when she's running up to Reagan's bedroom and she gets knocked over. And she just wasn't selling it. So they had like a, a, a crew member who was pushing her or something or whatever. And she hurt herself on one take and she was like, please, William, don't, I don't want to do that again. Don't do that. Go lighter. My back is starting to hurt. And William Friedkin's like, you got it, Ellen. All right. And yeah. he looks over to the crew member <laughs> and gives him a wink. And he's like, let her have it. And uh, fucks up her back real bad, really bad. But he got the good take out of that. So he would do things like that. Uh, the way that they were shooting French Connection in uh, New York City, I think it was. Was it New York City in French Connection? I think it was. I, th I believe it was. I believe it was. I believe it was. Uh, you know, uh, many of the car stunts with that were playing it fast and loose. And then Twilight Zone happens and William Friedkin takes a step back and goes, maybe I should be nicer to my actors. I don't want to wind up in court like John Landis. And so he kind of chills out <laughs> after that, thinks about some things, evaluates himself, and that's that's the end of that. I mean, nothing happened to John Landis, really, right? Right, yes, no. He went to a funeral and made a speech, made it about himself in the movie. Yeah. These children died was... for my movie. We must all go <laughs> see my movie now in their memory. Is it the Twilight Zone movie? Yes, Oh, especially that movie. It's not. It's not great. <laughs> it's not worth. No, it's not. His advice, his segment's know? not even that good. <laughs> it's, you know, certainly not worth dying. It's over. fine. Like it's it's enjoyable if you like that kind of campy, horror-y shit. But definitely not, you know, worth a couple of deaths. Now, um, I just saw something here. The movie Bug. Have you seen Bug? Three With Michael Bug. Shannon and the, Ashley Judd, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't really. That one's very strange to me. It's really weird because when, when it came out, um, I remember renting it. Uh, this 2006, I was living in Canada, and I remember renting it from, uh, from uh, Rogers Video. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really strange because it's supposed to be this psychological movie where she starts going nuts about you know, bugs being in her body or whatever. And visually it's really good. Like it's very unsettling and everything, but I, I, I guess maybe I just need to do a, a rewatch because when I saw it in 2006, uh, I, I was very bored by it. Uh, I just remember that visually it was really good, but then 
it's one of those movies that let, let, leave you like very unsatisfied with the ending and uh it has pretty good reviews it's like 62 in metacritic but i was wondering if you had seen it no no that, that's one that like, i i believe i've had on the tv before and didn't pay attention to it that's no i i, I believe the majority opinion on bug was it was kind of whatever when they dropped it and what was it like 2003 or 2006 something, something like that six yeah yeah and then gradually over time people discovered it through uh, streaming and the opinion of it has improved sharply in that time. That movie is about what a couple of like meth tweakers thinking there's bugs under their skin or something, right? Yeah, I think she goes through some type of uh, psychological trauma or something, or they do some type of drugs that makes them believe that they there's bug inside bugs inside of them or something. Uh, what about Killer Joe? Killer Joe is great. Killer Joe is yeah. the layup. For Matthew McConaughey to get his career on track. That's like the first serious movie uh, he wound up doing after his run of rom- uh, rom- romantic comedies. And that that is probably like the best way for Friedkin at this point to end his career on. Devil and Father Remorse. I don't know if you consider documentaries within a, a director's filmography. Some people do, some people don't. I think it depends on how many documentaries they've directed and also the style of the documentary. Uh, but Killer Joe's last narrative, his last fiction-based uh, film, he wrote that with uh, a playwright that was based on a stage play originally. And everybody delivers good performances. Very odd movie, very well shot film, and uh, it, it was a good comeuppance for Friedkin, who probably hadn't had a hit in a while. Uh, I know that you know some of, some of his movies in the aughts are downright terrible. There's a Tommy Lee Jones, Benicio Del Toro film that I think is called Hunted. And that is maybe, that's remarkably bad. Yeah, The Hunted, The Hunted. Uh, Remarkably bad uh, 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 piece of work from an extremely talented director. So. um, Yeah. um, I I was just going through his, uh, through McConaughey's, uh, filmography and he was he did lincoln lawyer before this before this one so okay so maybe maybe lincoln lawyer is the real start of that is it did anyone get my shit about that movie though i do remember people talking about lincoln lawyer and saying oh mcconaughey's i mean the movie's whatever but mcconaughey's surprisingly good in this well he was coming out of ghost of girlfriend's past so i doesn't wouldn't really take that much to improve that that performance, and then Bernie, sure. have you seen Bernie with with uh, Jack Black? No, that was Richard Linklater, right? Yeah, it's that's, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. I I I, enjoy, I remember enjoying that one. I thought Mud, which we've mentioned before, oh, Mud. which I've mentioned before, <laughs> which I've mentioned before multiple times. You know, I've only seen it once. I can't even remember if it's good or not. It's your favorite movie. But yeah, you funny. talk about it every show. You bring up Mud, a movie nobody has remembered. Mm-hmm. Now. uh, now that I see this, and it's completely unrelated to what this topic of this episode is, but uh, talk to me about your love for Magic Mike because I've never Mike. seen it. Magic Mike, I, I haven't, haven't seen, seen Magic it. Mike. What? What, you <laughs> what, are you talking, what are you talking about, Magic Mike? I've never watched Magic Mike before. What is it? Oh no, you said uh, Pain and Gain, right? Pain and Gain the... is much different than Magic oh, Mike. Pain and Gain, well, no, I've... Pain and Gain is a legitimately good film. I'm not saying that I I put out I put out a tweet that said that Pain and Gain was one of the defining films of the last decade. I I think that holds true. I think it's one of the last, along with Wolf of Wall Street, one of the last fun. These people are terrible, and we're gonna make a fun movie out of their whole thing. I mean, what they did is atrocious in real life and should not be a comedy, but it's a comedy. And I think it's Michael Bay's best movie, probably. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. And, I mean, it, wow. I, I, you know, you have The Rock playing a bad guy in that movie. When have you seen when have you seen Mark Wahlberg playing a bad guy in a movie even recently? I don't even know what it's about. I, I honestly confused Magic Mike with Pain and Gain. I haven't it's seen It's very any different. Of them. Very different. I haven't movies. seen it either. I thought it was both about like male gigolos or whatever. It, no. <laughs> that no, exercise. No, no, no. They're, they're, <laughs> they're bodybuilders. No, we should do a show on pain oh. and gain at some point. Um, that could be good to right. cover on the, on the program. Do you want to do a, do you want to do a Michael Bay retrospective? Do you know anyone that likes Michael Bay or that would like to talk about Michael Bay? Um, 
the the person I live with is a huge fan of Armageddon, but uh, they will not be on this program. So uh, other other than that, no, I don't know anybody who likes Michael Bay seriously. I mean, I, I honestly think that he's one of those people that are just maligned because you know it's cool to hate him. I've heard, I've heard that he's an asshole, which fine is you know an artist, which that's what happens. An artist. But I I've honestly yeah he likes to go by the artist. artist. That's how people address him yeah. when they're around him. <laughs> because if you look at his directing career, his early directing career is not bad. There's a couple of really good ones there. Uh, yeah, he's got the Transformers and the you know all the shit that comes out after that. But that, but you have you know Bad Boys. You have uh, the oof oh never mind i i thought there was more than this the rock is pretty good for what it is right i think i hey actually michael bay look uh, michael bay falls in the same category as nicholas cage and nickelback in terms of like aughts memes of like the worst thing the worst thing we're all gonna agree this is the worst thing right this is the worst at xyz you know and in reality no, they're not really that bad. They're never really. I mean, Nickelback. Yeah, he's, he, he's like yeah. a better Zack Snyder. No, no, hold on. <laughs> no, excuse me. Is that is that what you were leading up to? Is that what you were holding on to while you introduced pain and gain to the conversation? No, I, no. Just to drop that. No, How it, dare you? It just popped. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like a knife in the back. We're going to be, listen, <laughs> hey, we're going to be talking about Zack Snyder's four-hour R-rated Justice League when it drops in March. So do, just be ready for that. Be mentally prepared for that. That's cool. That's fine. I actually think, I know, I but can... uh, Michael Bay, I, I don't think I've ever really not enjoyed any of his movies. I remember I had Transformers on the television. I was like completely disgusted with the idea of watching a Transformers movie. But that that was actually fine. It was all right. I mean, Shia LaBeouf yeah. is good in it. Uh, the one movie uh, uh, in the Transformers series that I had watched, I watched, I think, the first three, was the one that he, you know, uh, he did not direct. That was the bad one. You know, I can't speak to any of the others. I'm never watching I, that shit. I think I've seen all of them. That's which cool. is kind of shameful. It's shameful to say. After I, <laughs> after past episodes, I've said that I've never seen an Indiana Jones movie, or you know, AT, or or Goonies, or you know those those classics that you're supposed to to know. But you know, I've seen every Transformer movie. Did you see the animated I guess Transformers? Why, no, I guess this is why Nick Aldershaw and Robbie Goodwin think I'm retarded. <laughs> <laughs> when when the episode, they're like. What do you mean you like Zack Snyder? They're every, he's everything you like. And I'm just like I don't but it, hold on, in fairness, it's literally just me, Nick, and Robbie who support openly support Zack Snyder's creative efforts. Everyone else likes to join the mob and kick poor Zack while he's down. After, <laughs> after his daughter killed herself, you go and you rail against him. You make fun of him at every opportunity. Unbelievable. After he had his movie stripped away from him, and everybody just laughs yeah. and points and makes fun. How come you don't feel the same way about the guy that did Fantastic Four? Josh movie Trank. Was Josh Trank. Yeah. I did feel that way <laughs> until he started trying to join, trying to join that mob and be like, "Hey, I'm one of you guys." Yeah, my movie sucks. You, you weak, pathetic worm. <laughs> no respect for that man. I have more respect for Max Landis. How about that? Max Landis yeah. retrospective. We can watch all his YouTube movies where he talks about wrestling and comic books. Or what is it, American Ultra? And what's is that a bottle of vodka? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can only take so much Zack Snyder abuse for one day. This has nothing to do with The Exorcist. Uh, what did you think of the ending of The Exorcist? Uh, the hmm. Because the you know the one I saw has that extra scene that to me it's completely unnecessary with um, the what is it a detective or someone I don't remember who that guy was yeah yeah the uh, uh, Kinderman Lieutenant Kinderman yes. who is going to be played yeah, by George yeah, yeah. C Scott in Exorcist three so that that's it's actually a good thing that you brought this up because it completely slipped my mind I think the two endings change the entire tone 
of each version of the movie. Uh, it is a much... I, I don't want to say it's a more nihilistic film without that interaction at the end. But it, it certainly feels like a bleaker ending without them talking and starting that friendship. I didn't like it because it it removed what the movie had set up, which is, you know, this thing could happen to anyone. You know, this this scary thing happening in this house uh, and then them acting like nothing happened kind of diminishes everything that we just saw for two hours at the end because he just leaves it in a in a in a what note instead of uh, oh, fuck, he felt because I'm trying to remember. But the original ending, we see Father Karras all fucked up on the ground. Right. And then yes. what it ends there. Or what no, 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 no. So we see Reagan and her mother moving out of the the uh the house that they had right. lived in and then Karis's friend who uh the other priest's name uh, character name is uh William O'Malley I think it's William O'Malley uh goes and you know has a word with the the mother uh Chris McNeil and Reagan just to check out to see how things are doing and Reagan sees the cross that uh, uh Father O'Malley has around his neck gives him a hug even though she has no recollection of anything that had came before. So it's kind of like she still has an internal recognition of what is good. Gives him a hug. And then I think he gives her the necklace, right? And then she drives off. Uh, The tubular bells start playing and that's the end of the movie. And it's kind of like, it it does, I think, emphasize the impact of the exorcism much more. And it feels bleaker. It feels darker. And... Mm. I yeah I, I agree with you. It, it's also a heavier ending without that yeah addition to it where you have O'Malley and uh, uh, Kinderman talking. But I feel like that interaction lends itself to what Blatty wanted and why ultimately why it was put back into the film, which is you come away with more of a sense that good has prevailed. Yeah, uh, I uh, um, I don't know. I, I didn't like it, uh, especially because the, I believe that the last frame is a boarded out window from the house, which to me is kind of like putting the nail on the coffin and getting rid of the story. So like saying, OK, so this happened and it's a story that happened and goodbye. It's never going to happen again. Or, you know, it's, it's very uh, definitive. Uh, you I know what? have liked it better if it's a little bit more open, like even, even what you just said about the original ending, I like it a little bit better because there's that thing about the amulet, like, or the metal medallion, whatever the fuck that is. Uh, something could happen there. Like, we don't know if she's going to need that or if that's going to be uh, worth anything to her. Um, on this ending, you even show the house boarded up. So like, no one's even going to go into this house. You're right. Uh, so the, the, you know, it's the the damage or like the that fear factor of this could happen not only here but anywhere else. Uh, it's I don't know diminished. I feel. Um, no, no, no. Hold on, you're, you're correct. That, that, that Cause, supernatural. Yes, no, no, no. You're you're totally right. You're right. I misremembered something with the original 1973 ending, which is that after that interaction takes place, I believe he's about to take the stairs down where Karis obviously fell to his death after jumping out the window. And it's kind of like a morbid, he decides not to, and then walks away. So you still end on kind of a sour note, where it's like, yeah, this was at yeah. a cost. Um, so what you're getting at with the the revised cut from 2000, where you still end on the boarded window, and then you cut to the tubular bells, where it feels like, yes, we have, we have the good prevails, but there's still this thing here. Um, it doesn't feel as smooth as the original 1973 ending, which is a harder, heavier ending and is more grounded, I think, in, in the real world. So you're right. I, I actually well, it do closes it, it, agree with that point. It, it closes a, closes a chapter of the story. Uh, I really believe that if the original one had ended like this, uh, I mean, they probably would have still come up with sequels just because they would have wanted to milk the the franchise. But... It would make 
less sense for them to be sequels if you have such a definite ending like this. Because then when Regan pop, pops up later, uh, then, you know, it, it doesn't fit with the boarding up of the house and the, them leaving. And then, not even them leaving, but they leave and we don't even stay with them. We move on to these other two characters that are unrelated because they're not really that involved into the story. They're just side characters that are a part of it. But by moving on to them and that conversation that I honestly can't remember, but I think it has nothing to do with what we just saw. Um, well, it's, 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 it echoes back. The, it echoes back to the mm-hmm. conversation that Kinderman had with Karis where he's inviting him out to a movie um, and yeah. Karis makes up an excuse right, right, right. or something and then winds up exiting. And uh, in, in this one, you have Kinderman inviting Father O'Malley to a play with, I think, it started Lucille Ball. Something made up. Something completely yeah. made up. And the yeah, father yeah, says, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, no, I've seen it. And, you know, that that's how the yeah, friendship because, starts. Because it shows us that, okay, so we've moved on. So, so now... Let's forget about this little girl and everything that happened. Now, what's going to happen with these two guys? Are they going to be friends? Are they going to, you know, like, and honestly, who cares? Uh, so it definitely removed a lot of, you know, whatever tension or whatever suspense was there, left there by the ending. I agree, I agree um, with you. It makes and, for a stronger uh, film. However, uh, I think this ending is necessary cruising into uh, Exorcist 3 because that's who the two characters are in that film that we're centered around. Okay. It's about the relationship between uh, Kinderman and Father O'Malley. And then specifically, Kinderman hunting a serial killer called the Gemini Killer. That's loosely based on the Zodiac. And there's two versions of that movie, that's, too. Um, that's three. That sounds more interesting than what we... Why are we talking about two with with <laughs> with our guest if it sucks? Well, if you like it. Well, I, I don't even know if I really like it, but I like aspects of it. I think there's a lot of creativity that is in that movie, and it's not a movie that a lot of people have discussed or talked about uh, in a framework that is anything other than this is a total piece of shit. Why was this made? This is awful. This is atrocious. Uh, but I think there's something that can that be uh, pulled from from that movie and also uh, the making of it. So I, I do want to get into that and then... Um, yeah, Exorcist 3. There's two versions of Exorcist 3. There's a version with Jason Miller from this movie, and there's a version without. And we have Brad Dorif as the Gemini Killer and Father Karras um, in that film. So in the original cut of that, which I believe Shout Factory released a version of it, but it fills in the gaps with dailies. So it cuts between the 35 millimeter print and then VHS scenes. Oh, you know. what was the movie that we, we did? They did that uh, Star 80, was it? No, uh, was it? No, not Star 80. Um, damn. Uh, what did we cover where they were doing that? It was something around that time, I think, where they do... Yeah, I fucking remember. Oh, uh, no. No, you lost it. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. What's the movie with the with the mummy, like the vampire mummy or whatever? That's The what? And transylvania there's like a like a mummy and like is it the host no the guest no the <laughs> I, I don't not, i don't understand i'm not gonna remember i don't think we did any vampire movie movies like, on this show that's got like nazi no not the keep it the C- keep Civic TV. it was the yes. keep yes yeah was it the keep that's the one i'm talking about that's the one i was trying to get to but i couldn't remember enough factors of it it was like nazis and the village and the vampire mummy thing, right? Right. Robots, yes. android. There's no androids Something in that movie. Like it's that. just the, it? the golem. The golem. Was it the keep? There was, I Were believe they, it was that the key. We saw that they do that. Were they I, they well, do like dailies or like the VHS. I think the thing with the keep was there's not an update. I mean, there is now, but there wasn't an updated print of that. So they pulled it from a VHS or or really rough copy. Although somebody recently obtained a 35 millimeter print of the keep and is doing like, uh, you know how demonoid used to be where it's like, you have to have a password and get in here and it's an exclusive membership. Someone released that on torrents. They cleaned it up in their own spare time. Uh, kind of like the aggressive star Wars fans do with the original trilogy. So, uh, that, right. that might be something to check out to see how it actually looks as opposed to just like a laser disc 
copy, which I think you had. You don't want to revisit the keep? I don't know. It's a bit long. (laughs) It's a little long, a little dull. Uh, uh, So which Exorcist 3 should I watch? Because I'm assuming we're going to do an episode on it now, since we've talked so much about it. I think it would be beneficial to watch both of them, to be honest with you, because they are different enough, and neither one is bad at all. I actually have come around to think that the the reshot, the re-edited version is actually better. They're both directed by William Peter Blatty, who did the ninth configuration as well. Um, mm. And it's a fairly, fairly good adaptation of his book, Legion. So here, here's the primary difference. The version that was released to theaters by, I think it's Morgan Creek is the production company, had Jason Miller swapping in and out of the role of Father Karras and the Gemini Killer with Brad Dorif. And there's an exorcism at the end of the movie, which was not in the film originally, because it wasn't called Exorcist 3. It was called Legion. But it's exorcist related. There's money to be made. They go with Exorcist 3. Mm. So there's an irrelevant exorcist character who I think has his skin peeled off and he dies. But he's he's completely pointless. And there's a couple of inserts leading up to him uh, where he's just like reading the Bible and there's a bird out his window or something and then he gets a weird feeling. But he's he's pointless to, to the movie. I think the ending is much more satisfying, though, in the theatrical cut as opposed to the original version. But Brad Dorif has more of a role in the original one. He's great. He's fantastic. He's always great. Yeah, he's, he's always he's great. That, he's that, uh, that weird... Is he still alive? Mm-hmm. What's he up to? I think What's he just he got cast as Chucky for the Chucky TV show. That's it. Mm, that's kind of depressing. That's how he's. I that's mean, he's how he's paying he's his getting, rent. He's getting work. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Get, get get that money, Brett. I guess, but he's so much better than just that. <laughs> what a what a shame. Well, I don't know. I I don't know his career where he's gone. I don't know if he's one of those actors that's succumbed to uh, substance abuse and ruined his career. I don't know. But everything I've seen him in, he's always great. Um, so I'm hoping that that Chucky show is going to pay him well. He's, he's I guess fine. who's putting it out? Uh, is it like Stars? Shutter? I don't know. It might be like the Paramount Network or USA or one of these one of these things. Whatever whatever Universal did, owns, I think. Did you, did you I just fucking thought of this? Did you know that they're doing a Sopranos prequel? Yes, I've heard about that. It's a movie. They got his son playing yeah. young him. Yeah. What do you what do you what do you think about that? Uh, uh, I don't I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's too I haven't seen any and there's nothing out yet. So I'm not gonna say it's a terrible idea. I think it's probably left best untouched. But it takes place thirty or forty years before the series. So Tony Soprano is going to be like 15 years old or something. And it's Michael Gandolfini who looks like him. And he acted in something recently. He was in some movie with, uh, with somebody. I I, I don't know. Um, It could, it could be, it could be fine. It could be great. I guess if you really care about how that character became who he was, but I don't think it's about him. I think it's about, um, it's about the race riots that were in New Jersey during that time. I oh, think it's going to focus on his dad. I When I oh. read about it, Tony Soprano is not going to be the lead character. It was going to be about his father and um, some of the, the, the organized crime that was happening in New Jersey in the 1960s. If it's like that, then it should be fine. Because okay. I, I think it's Terrence Winter yeah. who is directing it, writing it, and he's good. Um, but it could be, I mean, it could go either way. I think marketing it as a Sopranos prequel is a disaster. It, it would actually be very smart right now because a lot of people revisited that show and got into it during the I lockdowns. Am. Yeah, you are yeah. now? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, what, like five episodes deep of season one. I finished uh, it, it, it feels, a couple of months ago. After. It feels so so weird. It, you, all of it? Yeah, I got, through, the whole series? I got through all of it in probably about two months. I rewatched it for the first time maybe about 10 years. And I thought, I think that's the best show. I think that holds up better than any other scripted show. Doesn't it feel like even though you were alive in those years, I guess to me, I was nowhere near New York, uh, you know, uh, growing up. So when, when this was happening, uh, my 
reality was much different than whatever reality was happening in New York. So to me, it's very difficult to try to relate into that um, time frame of whatever, whenever that was, which is, I, I can't even remember if it's based on that time or if it's based on earlier than that. No, it, it's so, all, is it, it's, a, it, it is on the, yeah, it's in real time. At, 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 at the time that it was being released, it was in real time. So it was like 1997, 1998, maybe 99. Right. And then it ends in 2006. Mm -hmm. But they took a couple of years off in between along the way. I remember there was a, there was maybe about a year or two where they broke. It's just I, I found it, and this happened to with uh, happened with Breaking Bad too. Uh, I saw a couple of episodes recently. One of my friends was rewatching the whole thing, and they I didn't think they would, but they both feel like time capsules already. Uh, the Sopranos feels like a completely different existence that what we have now even though it's only what 20 years old mm -hmm. um so when i was watching it, it it was kind of i don't know it was kind of odd because it's so everything is so much different now that a lot of the things that happen in the show could not happen now you know just just with the if you just put the surveillance aspect you know a lot of the things that happened you know a couple of cameras there and everyone goes down or whatever so it's yeah. it, it, it's cool because you you have to suspend this belief for something w that you were alive to see or you were alive when this was happening but right. at the same time it's so different that I, I guess i didn't think it was going to feel like this just because it, it it feels like it hasn't been that long when that show came out but it you know once you realize that it's been 20 years and everything that's happened in those 20 years uh, because that show still feels relevant in like pop culture, like you mentioned, like people uh, revisiting it or whatever. But it, it gave me like an old, like a, like an odd feeling of watching it, just because everything is so different now that I felt like I was watching I don't know, like a like an old '70s gangster thing, you know, where it's like, like oh, this is uh, um, times past, you know, a thing that you know happened a long time ago, but it wasn't. You know? Right. They kind of address some of the changes that occur. I mean, they they do throughout the series, but specifically with like organized crime and the efficiency of that by, I think, the final season where they just have like two of the lesser mob figures go and they're going to go shake down a Starbucks. And they're, they're like, look, I, I can't I can't pay you. They, they keep track of the amount of bagels here. <laughs> uh, it's not like this is a mom and, pop, and they don't like get it. They're just like two old mob guys. And uh, it shows you like the, the decline cool. of... Mm -hmm civilization western civilization and organized crime existing within that 20th century bubble and how it's kind of been well i won't say it's been weeded out i think it still exists within certain sectors we'll say i think in politics it's very very alive uh, but if you're outside yeah. of that good luck I, I, when you eventually yeah, finish that but... we should do an episode on the sopranos for for our, our highly weighted sequel to almost movies with True Detective, Jake Hanrahan. Which, right, true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. I've, I've just, it's a show that I've never seen that I know I should. So I, you know, I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, it's very, I, I think it holds up better than Breaking Bad, uh, in my opinion. Breaking Bad, especially, uh, you know, we've said this before, the earlier seasons still feel like cable TV and not like HBO, but clearly AMC for that time. Where they're saying like uh, "damn" and "hell" and "crap," yeah. and they won't, <laughs> you know, commit the actual swear words. Or, you know, it's a little cleaner than it should be by the end of it. Uh, anyway, anything, anything else on the Exorcist 1973 or the version you've never seen before, which was a box office hit? The version you've never seen before! Exclamation point. When it came out, it's such an early 2000s title, too. Yeah. You know. Very exaggerated, very Bleh! yeah. Well, you got to think at that time, it's a, it's kind of a weird time to release it too, right at the right at the millennium. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the yeah. thirty year anniversary. It was only twenty seven years, and then they just decided, yeah, we're gonna throw that out there, and it was a hit. It it, it made it come back into the public uh, memory. You know, <clears throat> so at the time, I kind of understand it. I guess there was, no, I mean, DVD was still new, so you didn't have all these like alternate versions of movies that are out there, director's cut of deleted scenes. Um, right. That's how I discovered it. So, Yeah. 
But no, not really. I don't think there's much you can add about The Exorcist that hasn't been said by everyone that's seen it before. So There's two very um, good documentaries, if anybody wants more info. Um, one is called Leap of Faith. That's on <laughs> Shudder right now. It's just essentially an hour-long conversation with William Friedkin. And then there's another movie called Friedkin Uncut. Both were released last year, although Friedkin Uncut, I think, was made in 2018. And uh, they're both very good documentaries on his career and the making of The Exorcist. So I would I would highly recommend those. I'm trying to get my hands on. There was a paperback released in the 70s called The Making of Exorcist 2. There's just a, there's a, they, for whatever reason, they released that. There's not a documentary on The Making of Exorcist 2, but there's a paperback, 100 plus pages on information, production details. You're going to end up paying way too much for it. Sixty dollars, sixty-seven dollars on eBay. Gonna... I checked. Oh, that's not bad. That's not the worst. That's not bad. That's not what I'm uh, paying. That's what I'll say. That's not what it's gonna, yeah, yeah, end up being. Anyway, that that's been movies for this week. Uh, Hans is Hansikin, or no, you're not anymore. You're Hansikin Dose on Instagram. You're Hans Meme Memorial on Twitter. I am Loris yes. WB on Twitter and Facebook. Loris Wonderbread on Instagram. And, uh, yeah, if you want episodes early or exclusive episodes, go to patreon.com slash Lores. All right. Thank you for listening.